Hi, this is Dr. Kevin Kirby. In this lecture, I'm going to be discussing the biomechanics of terminology that we should be using as modern podiatrists, with the first topic being on force. When we talk about force, let's talk about some other terminology and concepts that are also important for us as podiatrists. First of all, let's talk about biomechanics. What is the definition of biomechanics? Biomechanics is a science that examines the forces acting upon and within a biological structure and the effects produced by such forces. So when we start to talk about forces, we have to understand it within the context of biomechanics in general that we deal with on a daily basis in our patients with mechanically related foot and lower extremity pathologies. And we should also give recognition to Sir Isaac Newton, who in 1687 wrote his treatise, The Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica, which means the mathematical principles in natural philosophy. And his three laws of motion, which were published in this, including his first law, that every object persists in a state of rest or uniform motion in a straight line, unless it's compelled to change by forces impressed upon it. In other words, Objects have inertia where they tend to either rest in one place without a force acting on it or tend to move in a straight line unless some other force acts on it. Newton's second law of motion is everyone knows as force equals mass times acceleration, meaning that there is an equivalency between force and mass and acceleration so that if we know what the force is and know what the mass of an object is, we can predict and calculate what its acceleration is. And then also the third law, which is also very well known, that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. In other words, if I apply a force to an object, it will apply a force back on me that is equal and opposite. So let's talk about a force. What exactly is it? Well, it's a mechanical disturbance or a load. And the force is the action of one object on another. It's the, going to be the force that is applied to an object that tends to make it either move accelerate, decelerate, or deform. Force is measured in newtons. One pound is approximately four and a half newtons, and one newton is approximately a quarter pound. There's four components of a force, and these are all important to understand how we look at this ground reaction force vector, which we often look at in podiatry, trying to understand that it has four separate components to it. So in this diagram here, I have the right foot in a running shoe striking on its heel during uh, running with the ground reaction force vector pushing up on the posterior lateral aspect of the heel. So what are the four components? The magnitude, which is going to be the amount of force acting at the ground reaction force vector. The line of action, which is going to be the line along which the ground reaction force vector acts. The direction, which is either going to be up or down this line of action, and the point of application, which in this case is going to be the posterior lateral aspect of the shoe sole. So this ground reaction force has a magnitude, point of application, line of action, and direction. Well, there's three types of main forces, and these are all also important to understand is that there is a compression force, which tends to squeeze materials together or tends to make the object shorter. Here we have a force acting on both sides of a bar that's tending to make it shorter. We have the tension force here that tends to pull materials apart. In other words, this tension force here is tending to make this bar longer. And a shearing force where we have, let's say in this instance, a pulling force on both sides that is going to push or pull one part of the body in one direction and another part of uh, another part of this body in an opposite direction. In other words, here is the shear force tending to slide these two objects apart, and that is the force that uh, is described as a shear force. So what are the various things that forces can do to objects, whether this object is a steel bar or a wood beam or a human foot? Well, it can accelerate. In other words, if we have a ball that's dropped from a table, the gravitational acceleration will tend to accelerate it toward the ground. 
it can decelerate, forces can decelerate. So when the ball bounces up from the ground to almost the same level as the table that it was dropped at, if it's a um, very elastic ball that has bounces well, then it's going to be accelerating initially, but then decelerating as it as gravitation tends to pull it more towards the Earth. Forces can also deform. So the impact force, where the ground is pushing up on this ball at the point of impact, it is going to flatten the ball and make it deform temporarily while it stores elastic strain energy to jump up towards its next height, toward the up again off the ground. And it can also, forces can also stabilize. And this is seen very clearly and when we analyze the forces of a bridge where we're gonna have compression forces in certain members of the bridge, tension forces in other areas of the bridge along the cables here, and the combination of these forces produces great stability that is gonna allow us to uh, drive vehicles of heavy loads across this structure simply by the unique arrangement of compression and tension forces across this structure to stabilize it, to allow it to act as a bridge that um, allows vehicles to drive across it. Well, there's also external and internal forces. And this is specifically important for us when we start talking about the human foot and the forces act on it, since the ground erection forces act on the human foot are quite large. Uh, the human foot has a in bipedal standing, each foot has half times the body weight. In unipedal standing with one foot, the force on the planar foot is one times the body weight. In walking, the force peaks at approximately 1.25 times body weight. In running, the force peaks in ground erection force at 2.5 times to three times body weight. And in sprinting, we can have ground reaction forces equaling five times the magnitude of uh, body weight. So these external forces are going to be the forces acting on the outer surface of the object. Here's some external forces acting underneath the first metatarsal, metatarsal heads. And here's another force acting across the planar hallux. But we also have, when those forces act, we have internal forces that are the result of the body tending to prevent deformation of the foot or stabilize the foot. Here's an internal force at the ankle joint where the tibia is pushing down. Here's the Achilles tendon having a tension force that is pulling up. So here we have a Achilles tendon tension force, a tibial, tatal tibial uh, compression force caused by compression. We have a plantar fascial tension force here resisting dorsiflexion of the forefoot on the rear foot. And this is both external and internal forces. And here we have an example of uh, an examiner pushing up on the forefoot of a subject. And we can see that the external force on the plantar forefoot is causing an increase in internal force of the ankle joint and an increase in internal force within the Achilles tendon. So these internal forces that act within our foot and lower extremity are the result of the external forces in other words, in order for the body and the foot and lower extremity and the body to resist deformation of its structure under these external forces, it has to have internal forces developed to resist those. And this gets us in the, one of the next lectures we're going to be talking about this idea of stress and how important that is also. So let's talk a little bit more about this topic of ground reaction force. Well, how do we measure ground reaction force in the human foot? Uh, the best way to measure ground rank for force and the most accurate is by using a force plate. Here we have a researcher looking at a runner running over a force plate in the lab. This, ground, this uh, force plate will give us a ground reaction force vector. It's going to give us the vertical component. In other words, that component that goes straight up and down. It's going to give us the anterior posterior shear component. In other words, that component either goes up forwards or backwards relative to the foot and ground, and also a medial and lateral component, which would be going medial and lateral. So when we combine those three components, this allows us to determine not only the three-dimensional location of this ground reaction force vector, here's ground reaction force vector uh, pointing posteriorly in early support phase of running. In mid-support, it, it points basically straight upwards. 
and then in propulsion, the ground reaction forces vector is going to be pointing forward. And this is how the ground reaction force vector changes in, uh, in uh, not only direction, but also spatial location or 3D location, but also is we have this other parameter that the force plate gives us, which is the center pressure, which is basically going to be the culmination of all the forces acting on the foot into a single point. And we can see how the center pressure is going to change from the heel to more the midfoot to the forefoot as we go from heel strike to mid support to toe. Another important point of forces is this concept of axial loading forces and eccentric loading forces. This is specifically a topic more geared toward the engineering field, but we do use this and it's important to understand when we start talking about tissue stress theory and how external forces can cause internal stresses and bending forces on bones, especially long bones. In this case, we have an axial loading force on the left because this compression force acting at the top of this beam is going along the long axis of this structure or central axis. Here we have the lower force, the ground reaction force. Here we have another force that's tending to load it. So we have an axial loading force that tends not to want to bend that beam. However, if we have a offset or eccentric axial loading force where the forces above and below this beam are offset from a central axis, then we are going to develop a centric loading force that tends to bend this structure. And when we have this sort of alignment where the, uh, the forces, loading forces are eccentric or offset, here on the right, it's going to be producing a bending force that tends to produce tension stress on the side that becomes convex and a compression force on the side that tends to become more concave. Whereas if we have the forces acting actually across this structure, it's going to be producing pure compression force. Actually, loading forces will produce just compression stresses, whereas as we start to move that Actual, move the axial loading force more eccentrically or offset it more from the central axis of the, uh, the, the structure, it's going to produce more compression uh, stressing along with the tension stress. So in summary, in this short lecture on forces, I just want to give you a brief introduction so that you can understand the importance of understanding all these terms that relate to force is that the four components of a force are its magnitude, its direction, line of action, and point of application. Tension, compression, shear forces are the three main types of forces that act on objects and our human body. These forces can either accelerate or decelerate an object, it can stabilize an object, or it can deform an object. And also ground reaction force is very important to understand because there's such large magnitudes of ground reaction force that act on the human foot. And during weight bearing activities, these external forces tend to cause internal forces within the foot and lower extremity. And these internal forces are necessary in order to prevent deformation of the human foot and lower extremity to allow it to move and allow to perform its multiple weight bearing activities during our daily activities. So I hope this lecture has been enjoyed by all and I will attempt to do more of these in the near future. Thank you very much for listening.